Well, in another riveting fireside chat, <clears throat> we're looking at acids and bases. If we were to do some nomenclature practice, practice and go through and look at these, we might refer to that first one as dihydrogen sulfide. We have dihydrogen sulfate. So note the name change. And then in that last one, it all of a sudden becomes sulfuric acid. And we get this big shift. Why do we get this big shift in the name? Okay, well, that big shift in the name comes from the fact that we have hydrogen in front and the AQ, which meant an acid. Well, why do I care? Why do I need a different name for an acid? It gets a different name as an acid because it's one of the kind of core uh, or first discovered reactive things. Okay, so observationalists, which is where a lot of science starts, is with, or all science starts, is with an observation. And they noted that certain compounds had some interesting properties. So believe it or not, they would taste these compounds and they noticed that they had this sour taste to them. And it also, on their fingers, made it feel kind of sticky. And so they were great. They had these characteristics. Um, they also potentially tested these to realize that it, that sticky feeling was their hand dissolving. The sour taste usually resulted in death, like there were all sorts of kind of bad side effects. But they went through and they came up with a description behind these things. Okay, And that word that they used to describe these was acids. Okay, And they, uh, from the root, I believe, acre, or A-C-R, which is... Uh, like kind of bad tasting, maybe something like that, sharp tasting. And that's where we're getting acids from. Well, as observationalists continue to note substances, they also found these other substances that were bitter tasting and kind of slippery feeling. And perhaps by chance, they ended up mixing these things. And in the process of mixing them, uh, they got a awfully hot reaction. And hot, while spelled with an H, is not followed by two O. Um, they got a hot reaction. So that hot reaction then added a potential hazard with this. So they wanted to make sure that they could go through and ensure a, a way to name these things such that we would know to keep them separate. Because if they accidentally mixed, we would get this very hot, boiling, dangerous system. So they labeled one as acids and the other as bases. And what they found was the things that they labeled as bases all had this bitter taste, slippery feeling, and those that were acids had this sour taste and sticky feeling. What we have later come to learn is that what has happened when they were mixed was what is a neutralization reaction. And in that neutralization, we know from earlier in the semester that it forms salt, and here's where that H2O was coming from, and water. And we've now neutralized uh, the activity of those materials. Um, but that's kind of our origin here. And so what we get are acids and bases. And so what we see below is a standard acid. And the patterns that we found earlier on for nomenclature is that we typically saw an H in front and we usually see an AQ in back. That is a vastly oversimplified definition. And you'll note that this particular instructor typically hates showing phases and has unintentionally removed them from each of these things. Okay, so that could make it a little bit more challenging to deal with. Our bases, we know to be bases because they reacted with the acids in this neutralization. Well, that in and of itself as a definition is a pretty piss poor one because that means the only way that I know that I have a dangerous potential reaction is to react it and thereby see that it was dangerous. That that's a bad system. You end up uh, exposing yourself to those dangers in the process of that discovery. So what we would like to do is come up with some way that we could define these things. And that first definition of uh, acids and bases that now is a little bit broader than H in front and AQ in back uh, came out with the Arrhenius definition. And so in his definition, what he went through and said was that if we take a substance, namely an acid, and we add it to water, what happens? If the hydrogen ion concentration goes up, we would then reference the HCl species that we started with as an acid. And that's it. Okay. So what if it was HC2H3O2? 
Well, if I add it to water and I notice the H plus concentration goes up, then, well, it's an acid. So I'm doing a relatively simple reaction because all I'm doing is, is really diluting it with H2O, with water. So it's not a big deal, and we can make these conclusions. What happens with our bases? Well, Arrhenius went through and noted with the bases that he was picking up or using that if he did the same thing and added them to water and we saw an increase in hydroxide ion, that that was labeled as a base. And before we start going, well, why would we pick these arbitrarily or seemingly arbitrarily identified things as H plus and OH minus, why did we pick those ions to characterize our acids and our bases? It might be helpful to remember that when we mix these, we got a neutralization reaction. And in that neutralization, we produced the substance of a salt and H2O. Because you're in theory listening to this lecture because you've liked how I've presented things, or you've been forced to, uh, you may have also seen that we could have written H2O as HOH. And why is that important? Well, where did the H come from? The acid, the OH, from the base. So really, Arrhenius' definition was acknowledging that water was such an important substance and that if we could split it, we could split it into the pieces that are reactive. And they are become reactive because they're trying to neutralize each other or neutralize their reactivity through the formation of water. Right? So this is Arrhenius' definition. And I get a bit melodramatic here when I go through and call this useless. It isn't that it's useless. Okay? It is very useful, and we tend to use it, I would argue, probably through all of general chemistry. Um, because those reactions all run in water environments. And as long as we're running in water environments, this definition works out phenomenally well. Okay? So that is our first definition. Is our Arrhenius definition, acids increase hydrogen, bases increase hydroxide. The second definition to come along was Bronsted-Lowry. Why create a new definition? Well, we noted that there were certain circumstances that we didn't see the presence of hydroxide, but they were still neutralizing our acids. So we're still getting this neutralization happening, but we aren't seeing it through the process of water, which means we need to tweak our definition to expand the reactive labeling to a larger system or a larger environment. Okay, And that's where we get our Bronsted-Lowry definition. And the Bronsted-Lowry definition decided to really still keep the hydrogen ion donor aspect. So our acids are still going to supply H+. And really, the, the base definition is now different because the base doesn't say that it has to be hydroxide. It can really be any species. The base can be anything as long as, through the course of it acting as a base, it accepts a hydrogen. So it must somehow accept a hydrogen. In the process of accepting H+, it becomes positively charged. This is now our hydrogen ion acceptor, or our Bronsted-Lowry base definition. Okay? This increases the breadth or the range for our acid-base definitions, so it can now apply to a larger range of reactions, which is pretty cool. Okay? To that end, when we talk about acids and bases, uh, and actually not to that end, it applies to a broader range. But the, the deal with applying to a broader range is that it must still also apply to our old definitions of Arrhenius. Well, the acid one still makes sense. We're still seeing hydrogen. The base one becomes a little bit more confusing. How is the base one still incorporating both Arrhenius's definition and the uh, Bronsted-Lowry? Well, if in the course of acting as a base, we would accept that hydrogen, we've now satisfied the definition. Hydroxide does accept hydrogen to neutralize the acid. So hydroxide still fits within the definition. It is a hydrogen ion acceptor, or it can accept hydrogens. So it still fits. Really what the Bronsted-Lowry definition says is that other things, other than hydroxide, could also accept electrons and still be defined as a base without having to center on the 
the water aspect of our acid-base definition addressed through Arrhenius. When we think about our acid-base reactions, there is a third. That third definition is, a, is the Lewis definition, which now changes focus entirely and only looks at the electrons. That is much more difficult for students to process because when we look at a chemical reaction, we don't see electrons move around, we see atoms. And that's why we don't have a slide defining those Lewis definitions because it's, it's not necessary at this stage in the game except to know that there is a third option and it is called the Lewis definition of acids and bases. Where does this ultimately then go is being able to apply and see what we can come up with. So we've got two reactions set up here. Okay, the bottom one I'm going to leave you to go through and solve. The top one we will work out together. So let's go ahead and take a look at the top one. We've got two species and we've got to decide whether they are acids or bases. Okay, to help out our acid we said was a proton donor. Okay, why do we call it a proton? Well, what it's donating is H+. And if we go back to our definitions of subatomic particles, and we were to build a hydrogen ion, well, it has no electrons. It has no neutron, because it's hydrogen. All it has is a single proton. So H+, is effectively just a proton. Okay, so what we would need to look for for an acid would be something that has hydrogen in it. This is why we're starting with this one. H3O plus is the only one that has hydrogen in it, so it's going to be the acid. What is our base? Well, the base must be a proton acceptor. To accept that proton, okay, it has to have something to give to hydrogen to keep hydrogen connected. Well, since the hydrogen is positive, what that base needs to supply is some source of electrons. Electrons are negative. When we go back and look at our def or our structure here, SO3 minus 2 minus 2 is negative. It's going to be our base. How do we apply this to our chemical reaction? Okay, well, what am I going to do? I want to have that SO3 minus 2 act as a base. If it acts as a base, it must accept a proton which means I need to add a hydrogen to the formula, HSO3. What happens to its charge? Okay, and at this point, all we're doing is doing one reaction here. What happens to its charge? Well, if I add a single H plus to that formula, I'm going to cancel one of those negative charges, and my overall charge will become a negative one. Okay. Well, where did that hydrogen come from? Well, that hydrogen had to come from our acid. So what does an acid do? Well, an acid is a proton donor. So that means it loses H plus in the course of the reaction, which means I need to get rid of a hydrogen. So instead of being H3O, it'll be H2O. Okay, so I got rid of that hydrogen. What happens to its charge? Well, it started as a positive, but I got rid of H plus. So I lost a positive. I'm now going to be neutral. I only lost one positive. So there it is. And there would be my chemical equation representing this whole process, which is kind of neat. Okay? And I'm going to draw that arrow back on in just a second here. Okay. So what can we do after this? Well, again, acids and bases, I want you to be able to address what species are acting as acids and bases. So let's go through and look at this reaction and look at a kind of new piece to it. That new piece you might see in between. What is special about that arrow that we're now using to represent this reaction? Well, there's two. It goes left to right and right to left. On the, the empty side of an arrowhead, so there's an arrowhead, we have reactants. On the pointy side of our arrowhead, we have products. Well, if we turn the arrow around and have it aim the other direction, the pointy side still points to products, and the other side would be reactants. This becomes a challenging concept because we are now flipping the reaction. Reactants aren't always on the left, products aren't always on the right, they can be on either side, depending on our point of view 
for an individual chemical reaction. So let's use that information to address our point of view. If we take a look at HSO3 minus, which species does it look most like on the product side? Okay, hopefully what you can acknowledge is that looks an awful lot like our base species, the SO3 minus two. Well, for HSO3 minus to go to SO3 minus two, what did it have to do? Well, it had to lose a hydrogen or lose H plus. That lose could be a confusing term because we've used that in oxidation and reduction. So instead, let's switch that to donate. Okay. If it is donating H plus, that would mean HSO3 minus is acting as an acid. So interesting, our reaction now has two acids. Well, what happens for the other one, Okay, our H2O? It went to become H3O+. plus. Well, how did it go through and do that? Well, to become H, go from H2O to H3O+, plus, it had to accept NH+, plus, which thereby means that species acted as a base. So cool, we're now able to label acids and bases regardless of where they show up in a chemical expression as either reactants or products and be able to interpret how those molecules could change their potential reactivities. That's kind of cool and so that's what we're really trying to get at with this. But now how could we ask a question about this? Well, let's start it. Identify the acid. Okay. So a multiple choice question, identify the acid. Answer choice A, B, C, or D. And for those of you being like, well, it's B and C, you wrote acid underneath those. No. Okay. Only one answer is an acceptable answer. Hmm. That makes things a little bit more challenging to be able to identify. Okay. And it addresses the issue with our labeling. We've called the acid in the base, and we've just said there's really no difference between reactants and products. But there is a difference. That's what we call one reactant and one product. This is where we introduce the idea of conjugate partners. Okay, On the product side, those aren't acids and bases. Those are conjugate acid and conjugate base. Okay, Conjugate meaning similar to. So the conjugate acids partner would be SO3 minus 2. Okay? That's their relationship. So now when I ask the question, which one's an acid, you can tell me very cleanly it's H3O+. This clarifies our language and ensures that when we ask simple questions like which one's the acid, which one's the base, we know very specifically which one you're referring to. Okay? And so that's kind of cool. And so, whoa, that was not the button I wanted to push. Okay, um, what that now does is that cleans up our system and we now have all of these phenomenal labels that we could go through and interpret. So what I would like you to go through and do, okay, is do the same process for the equation down here. HSO3 minus plus H2O goes to what? Predict what those products are label out base, acid, conjugate acid, conjugate base, put on your donate H+, plus, don't accept H+, plus, label the crap out of it like we've got up here. So again, I'm going to go ahead and say pause the video. That means click space or hit space, click the screen, click just the little pause button to stop the video, um, and solve that question out for me. Thank you. Good job for that. And here's your reward. And here's your reward for having done everything that I asked you to go through and do. HSO3 minus, because it is negatively charged, acts as a base uh, and will accept a hydrogen to become H2SO3, making our conjugate acid. H2O, because it has hydrogen, will act as an acid. Uh, and donate that hydrogen to our HSO3- minus to form hydroxide, and we now have our conjugate base. And we would have our lovely answer. But I said there was a reward, and I'm pretty sure that if you look at your work, you probably didn't, didn't draw what I just drew. Okay? 
um, which seems a bit odd. For those of you that didn't actually draw it out, you're like, well, I have no idea what's going on. I didn't draw anything. Well, maybe next time you should actually draw it out. Um, and for those people that did draw a reaction out, they were like, but I, I, didn't, I didn't do that. Okay, I would bet that what you did was that one. What makes this interesting is that if we go through and we compare these two reactions, our HSO3 minus in one reaction acted as an acid, and in the other reaction, it acted as a base. Why can it do both of those things? Well, the definition of an acid was that it can donate a proton. Does it have a hydrogen to donate? Yes. So it makes sense for it to act as an acid, so the top one must be correct, which I'm going to bet is probably the one that you guys went through and wrote out. Um, so why not write the bottom one? Well, let's look at the bottom one. What does the bottom one have? Well, the bottom one is HSO3 minus. Well, bases are negatively charged, so it should act as a base. So in this argument, who's correct? Well, we're both correct, okay? assuming I didn't make any other mistakes within this. Okay? HSO3 minus has the ability to act as both an acid and a base. That makes it amphoteric. Okay? If we think about amphibians, okay, amphibians mean they can jump between both land and not sea. Uh, water is the word. Amphoteric is following that same root. That amph root is saying that it can go both directions. It can act as both an acid and a base. Okay, and so that's what makes this interesting and kind of fun. At this point, what I now am going to have to kind of delay and shuffle because of video organization is that the next thing that we really want to address would be this double-headed arrow. That double-headed arrow I'm going to discuss in the next video on equilibrium. Okay, or not the double-headed, but the two arrow happening in there. Okay, that equilibrium is going to help explain what's going on in the next sequence of slides. Um, after, yeah, in the next sequence of slides, as we go ahead and advance forwards. How do we decide strong versus weak? Well, a strong acid and or base, and since acids tend to be the easiest one for us to address, we'll look at this. So there's a generic acid, HA, completely ionizes when it hits water. So we get H plus plus A minus. So that reaction only goes one direction towards products because that species we've identified as being a strong acid. That identification of it being a strong acid largely comes from establishing equilibrium stuff, which we haven't done yet as far as this video is concerned. If we look at H, let's go ahead and call it B, HB, if it's going to act as an acid, is still going to produce H plus and now B minus. So it's a different acid in this case because we're getting B minus versus A minus. This reaction is actually a weak acid. If it's a weak acid, what happens? Well, because it is a weak acid, we get the double-headed arrow or our two arrows, one going to the left and one going to the right. Okay, That combination of those two arrows is stemming from our weak aspect. It's saying that it ionizes to different amounts. So weak acids can sometimes produce lots of H+, sometimes they don't produce that much. Okay, Strong acids always and only produce lots of H+. So it has to do with kind of the directionality of that arrow. That arrow is what is known as equilibrium, and like I said, that's going to be addressed in the next video. So how would we be able to differentiate between our strong and our weak acids? Well, the strong acids are the dangerous ones. So we tend to uh, call out those dangers by just straight up memorizing them. So depending at what level of chemistry you need to move through, you might be asked to memorize your strong acids and bases. So here are your strong at one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six strong acids listed here. There are more than six, but these happen to be the six most common. And in a class where this was expected, those were the six acids that students were expected to memorize. For our class, for Chem 130, we don't need to memorize those. What I want you to be able to do is to acknowledge that there's a difference between a strong acid and a weak acid. And similarly, there's a difference between a strong base and a weak base. 
The strong acids would be things that we would just memorize, and then the weak acids and bases would be anything that, well, wasn't a strong acid or base. And that's kind of our big conclusion out of these. You'll also note that we're seeing another kind of key term floating out here, an electrolyte. We'll define that as another term in... Actually, I think I'm going to do it in this video. I just may have to skip some slides around. Okay, so we'll see that in a little bit. Okay, so we've got this strong versus weak. The next thing we want to tr think about is safety. Okay, what makes the poison is the concentration or how much is there. Well, we talked about concentration already in, in this class, and that was our units of molarity or that capital M. Okay, so we could sh shout to Timmy, hey, watch out for that 0.15 molar H plus solution. It'll burn you. Okay, well, that's a bit of a, a problem. Uh, because Timmy, number one, doesn't know decimals, and number two, doesn't know capital M, what the heck does that mean? Okay, And neither did you. So if you think about your safety and what you've gone through in your experience, really what we're trying to address is how can we get the average populace to be able to understand something about the hazards of strong acids and bases but without making them go through a big course that addresses decimal meanings, that addresses new language, okay, capital M's and those meanings. So how do we address this? Well, think back to your knowledge already of acids and bases. Do you already know of a system that allowed you to classify different solutions according to their acidity or basicity? Hopefully, yes, you've been trained about pH. Okay, So pH was a way to convert those concentrations that are very difficult for the human brain to wrap around and convert that into a system that was easier for people to deal with. Interestingly enough, what does that system rank at? 0 to 14. Okay, For those people wondering about the numbers, 14 is just outside of our realm of understanding Okay, but it's in that range. The decimal values were way outside of our understanding and virtually impossible to understand. So what we can go through and do is now teach a kid numbers 0 to 14. This is what we do in math classes to get you used to manipulating numbers at that scale. And we can now go through and add some extra information on top of those numbers. That low pHs, something like 0 or 1, would be acidic and are bad quote-unquote bad or dangerous, and that solutions of high pHs, like 14 on this scale, are now bad or dangerous as well, and those would be basic. And that really, halfway in between those two bads, pH of 7, would be our safe spot. Okay, And that should have been theoretically what you've seen in your past. Okay, How do we get to that? Well, we would get to that pH system and that numerical system by using a negative log of the concentration of H+. Okay? So why do we not tell students about that? Well, it introduces this idea of logarithms, which confuses people. It introduces this issue with negatives, which confuses people. Those brackets meant concentration, which confuses people. There's so many different things about that that confuse people. So we just said, hell with it, 0 to 14 we have now converted the science into a, a, a format that is a little bit easier to digest. And yes, it oversimplifies things um, perhaps excessively, but it at least allows a baseline that we can now have those conversations with the average populace without having to really drill into dealing with concentrations and calculations and all of that fun stuff, okay? And just for the record, just staying inside pretty simple directions, and we can see how horribly uh, people are following those directions. We're not going to be able to deal with concentrations, teaching that to everybody, everywhere. Um, second to last slide for this video, the big deal that we're getting out of this, or why we address acids, is really to get this concept of buffers. Okay, The whole point of a buffer, okay, in this case a car buffer, is to minimize the visibility of scratches and dents. The same thing happens in chemistry, except it's not scratches and dents. It's minimizing changes in pH, okay? So minimizing changes in the acid or base content. 
Why is that really important? Well, we've got a big long expression written down below. We've got a whole bunch of arrows going back and forth talking about our equilibrium. And really, we don't need equilibrium to address this right now. But what these are trying to show <clears throat> is what's happening in our blood. Our blood centers around the concentration pretty much right in here. Okay, so what our blood does is it changes the concentrations of H2CO3 in comparison to HCO3 minus. And so there are small amounts of those substances in our blood right now. Okay, and why is this important for us? Well, let's say our blood all of a sudden goes slightly basic. In the process of it being basic, our pH is going to skyrocket upwards, and that could burn us, okay? And that would burn internally. So what needs to happen is that something would need to come along and remove that basic stuff. So if I add a whole bunch of hydroxide, what happens? Well, the hydroxide will react out with the H+. That means I've neutralized the hydroxide, okay? It's no longer there but I now also don't have H+. Since I'm missing that H+, my pH could potentially go up. This is where our equilibrium comes into play. The small amount of concentration I have of H2CO3 will then go, well, crap, I need to fill that hole so it will shift to produce. So the concentration of H2CO3 will go down while the concentration of HCO3- minus goes up and the concentration of H plus goes up. This is now going to ensure that our concentration of H plus stays relatively constant, even though I've added a base. Well, what happens uh, if instead of adding a base, I add more H plus? You go, well, the H plus can't cancel H plus, but what could cancel the H plus would be a negatively charged species acting like a base. And what will that species do? that will react with the H+, the extra stuff, and it will cancel it out. The net result is that the concentration of H+, overall, doesn't change. It stays constant, which means our pH won't change. So our buffers exist to help minimize the changes in pH. Okay, again, why is this important? This goes all the way back to intermolecular forces. As we change acids and bases, we end up changing the charge in the solution. If the solution changes charge, all of the structures will also change their charge, and that changes how they interact with their environment. And so you can get some really massive, big changes happening. Okay, So big, big deal. We see it in our blood pH. What's being shown on the far left is an example of this. Okay, What they're referencing is that we're starting with blood in kind of a homo homeostasis, meaning our pH is constant. What happens if the pH goes down? Well, pH going down means H plus goes up. Remember, it's more acidic. This is now known as acidosis. We have more acid present. As the acid concentration goes up, this starts to send off signals in our body. Those signals, in turn, increase respiration. Okay? That means we start exhaling. Okay? As we start exhaling more, we start losing CO2. So that CO2 concentration goes down. As that CO2 concentration goes down, that's going to now need to get replaced and so the H2CO3 in our blood is going to start to replace that CO2. Okay? So our reaction starts to decrease the H2CO3. As the H2CO3 goes down, what happens? Well, we need to replace that H2CO3 by doing the next reaction. So that next reaction is then going to cause this H plus to go down also. Okay? What does that mean? We initially spiked the reaction by adding H plus into this. The end result at the cascade of these reactions was that the H plus concentration goes down. It counteracts the H plus spike that started the whole cascade. And the homeostasis, or our pH, stays constant.
And this happens regardless of whether it's an acid system, acidosis, or alkalosis, which is in reference to our alkali earth metals, where our pH goes up. If our pH goes up, we're becoming more basic. If it's more basic, that means our H plus concentration is artificially being pulled down. How, what happens to it? Again, we see all the signals. Those reactions cause the cascade to shift how our reactions move through to ensure that the concentration of H plus, ultimately our pH, remains constant. Okay, can we overwhelm the buffer? Absolutely. Okay, so and that's typically when one of those systems in this process fails. Okay, and this is vastly simplified. But if one of those systems falls apart and stops actually functioning appropriately, our body can't maintain the pH appropriately. And that's where our blood effectively starts dissolving all of the biological material it comes in contact with, which is, would ultimately mean, well, death. Okay? Um, and before you're thinking like, oh, you just melt, it's not that dramatic. Um, it just means pretty much everything falls apart and stops functioning. And so you would just die. Okay? Uh, and so that's what's happening with our buffers. It's a really big deal. It's kind of neat. Um, if you're going into the nursing field, you will be studying up the yin-yang about this buffer system and probably three or four others that are critical for understanding both respiration and then drug dosing as well. Okay, And with that, I'm going to do a quick pause on the video so that I can skip to the electrolyte slide because the electrolytes, I think, tie in kind of better with this. And then here are our electrolytes, which are a real quick kind of one-off topic that I'm not super stressed about, okay? What we're talking about, and you shouldn't be stressed about it either, is that when we add something to water and it completely ionizes, it's an electrolyte. What did we say a strong acid was? A strong acid was something that completely ionized. So strong acids are good electrolytes or strong electrolytes. Okay, why does this become important for us? If we looked at a container, so put in a beaker, we've got some water in here, and we take some copper electrodes and we drop them in here, and we attach those electrodes to a battery, all that fun stuff, and then we put a light on the top of this. Okay. If, okay, and it's a big if, if the circuit completes between those copper electrodes, okay, electric, if electricity can flow, then the light glows. If the electric current can't transition between those, then our light doesn't glow. Okay, So this is why electrolytes are cool. What electrolytes are are just ions, positive and negative ions. Those positive and negative ions can align themselves between the electrode, allowing for electrons to flow from one side up to the other. Why is that important? If we get electric flow, that's what's going to allow our light to come on. So we can think about electrolytes as electricity lights, okay? literally turning on a light. Okay? Um, so we can, why is this important for us? Well, if we think about the entire human body, how everything functions is actually through the flow of electricity. There are small electrical uh, terminals within your bodies and nerves that are allowing for signals to be transferred. We need electrolytes in there to allow for that flow of charge. If we don't have electrolytes, then our bodies stop functioning. This is why if you've ever gotten serious leg cramps, one of the things they tell you to do is say, drink up potassium or get potassium into your body. Why? Potassium, not as the metal, but as the ion form, is an electrolyte that will allow for the passage of electrons, okay? Or that electric current, which is what's going to allow your muscles to actually relax or contract, okay? So electrolytes are very, very important. So what you need to be able to do is to look at a formula and decide if it's an electrolyte. So, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is an electrolyte. How do you know sodium chloride is an electrolyte? You've probably already memorized that outside of the class. So let's move on to a different one. H2SO4. 
is an electrolyte. Why? That was one of our strong acids. As a strong acid, it is by definition completely ionizing. So a strong electrolyte. The next one, sodium hydroxide, a strong base. And because it is a strong base, it by definition completely ionizes. And so it therefore will also be a strong electrolyte. Okay, kind of bringing back the concept of our sodium chloride, calcium carbonate, iron hydroxide, and silver bromide. Well, sodium chloride, we said you might have memorized, okay, and just knew that that one would dissolve in water and get us those ions. That's how we know we broke that bond and how we know it's a chemical reaction. But how would we know, say, calcium carbonate, iron hydroxide, or silver bromide? That becomes a little bit more challenging. Really, with your sodium chloride, you're saying you knew that through experience. And really, experience is just another form of saying you've already done the experiment. Okay? Well, determining if something is an ion is also based on experiment. And you've already experienced this. In fact, you know how to identify if these species dissolve in water and should be labeled as aqueous or if they do not dissolve in water and should be labeled as solids. That rule would come from our solubility rules. Those solubility rules are not things that I expect you to memorize, but I do expect you to have memorized that you need to use them to determine solubility for ionic substances. And when you go and look up those solubility rules, you will find that calcium carbonate, iron hydroxide, and silver bromide are all insoluble in water. Well, if they never dissolve in water, they can't be electrolytes. Okay? And this would make them either non-electrolytes or very weak electrolytes. At this stage, all I'd want you to do is say non-electrolytes. And the first ones would be strong electrolytes. So we're applying the definition of our acids and bases to our electrolytes. We're applying our definitions of solubility of ionic compounds, going all the way back to unit two with our double replacements uh, to get our non-electrolytes. And then we've got the last category down below deciding with these. Okay. Well, none of these are strong acids and bases, though we do see a tip off that we're looking at a, an acid here. We would know it is weak because we memorized that it's not one of the strong ones. Okay, How do we know whether these should be strong or non-electrolytes? They don't fit the strong definition for acids and bases. They don't fit the definition that we've been using for solubility because they aren't ionic. Our solubility rules only apply to ionic compounds. All three of those compounds at the bottom are molecular compounds. So how would we go through and classify those? Well, molecular compounds don't ionize to large extents. So these end up coming in again as non-electrolytes. The last thing I want to call attention to, which is conveniently located in that immediate vicinity there, is that I will sometimes get students saying, but... Isn't that substance a strong base? Don't you see the presence of hydroxide in that blue box? And to that, I will say, no. There is no hydroxide in that blue box. This becomes a really important definition that usually goes over everybody's head, including some instructors. Okay? That is not hydroxide. What is hydroxide? Hydroxide, as a formula, was OH minus. Okay. Isn't this OH? Yes. Is it OH minus? For it to be the minus, this would have to be ionic. In that blue box, those are all non-metals, which means by definition, they are not ionic. That is not hydroxide, that just is a misleading OH. Okay? So that is an important distinction to make with that. And with that, I will go ahead and end this lecture. Thank you for listening. You only have one more lecture. Uh, that is both for you and for me. Woohoo!